All right, so today I wanna to just talk about one idea. And I think this is going to be perhaps the most useful idea that you ever listen to about how to learn effectively. And I know that a lot of the people here are in school right now and you have a lot of school ahead of you. You have you know, the rest of middle school and high school, you have university classes, you have all the learning that you wanna do in your life, if you have books that you wanna read, there's stuff that you're gonna to have to do for your later jobs, your careers. So really you have an entire lifetime of learning. And so I want to try in this half hour lecture to try to impart upon you one of the most important ideas that you can have if you are going to learn something effectively. And it's one that a lot of adults are not aware of. I say this because I was an adult and I was not aware of it when I started. And so I want to try to teach it to you. Now, I know normally I'm not normally teaching um, kids. I'm normally teaching adults. And so I am I'm very confident that you are smart enough to understand, but I'm going to do my very best to try to explain the idea clearly. But if there's anything you don't understand about it, I'm more than happy to try to break it down and explain it to you because I think it is that important. So before I get started in saying what the idea is, I want to share a few little uh, vignettes, little stories to kind of try to illustrate it and try to get your interest peaked. So the first one happened to me uh, several years ago. I'm flying on a plane and I'm going into another country with a friend of mine. And we get to the part of the journey where they want you to take out your passport and fill out the customs declaration. And I'm sitting with a good friend of mine. And what I do is what, what most normal people would do is that I open my passport, I look at the number that I have, and then I write it down in the customs form. But my friend doesn't do this. He just pulls out the customs form and without having the password open, writes down the number. And I'm pretty impressed by this. I'm being, you've memorized your passport number. And he kind of looked at me like I was the crazy one. It's like, you haven't memorized your passport number. And uh, I found out that it wasn't just his passport number he had memorized. He memorizes all his credit card numbers. He memorizes most of the phone numbers of people he knows, even though these days, most people don't have phone numbers in their contact books and things like that. And so I was kind of curious about this. You know, I think it might be the kind of thing that you would just say, well, maybe he's just really good at memorizing numbers. It's just a skill that he has and it's just a talent he has for memorizing numbers. But I know him, I know him pretty well. We've been friends for a long time. And I know that he's not like some kind of super genius, some sort of savant for remembering numbers. And so I was just curious, what is it he's doing that allows him to remember his numbers in a way that you know I have not? And I was even flying more than him in this time period. So if anyone would have had a more of an opportunity to memorize the passport numbers, it would have been me. So that's the first little story. And I'll explain to you the sort of solution to it a little bit later. The second one, I wanna talk about something that you probably all experienced. You go and you meet someone new and they tell you their name and it goes in one year and out the other and you completely forget it. Why has this happened? Why is it so common that someone can tell you their name and five seconds later, you have no idea what they just said? And there's lots of things that you will remember for the rest of your life, but you don't remember when someone tells you their name. Okay, third little example now. Maybe one a little bit more relevant to what we're talking about here. So you are studying for a test and you are studying really, really hard. And you go when you take the test actually you're actually you've been studying for it and your time to take the test and all of a sudden you can't remember any of the things that you studied you studied really really hard but you can't remember what the answers to the questions are and i've talked to students who have said this in almost kind of a you know they they view it as the fault of the professor that they must have tricked them right that the that they they knew the information they studied it so hard so it must just be that those those darn questions were tricks that they weren't actually fair questions. So at first glance, these three situations seem to have nothing to do with each other. You know, me flying on a plane, uh, you know, little silly things with the passport numbers, trying to remember someone's name at a party or meeting someone for the first time versus studying for a test. But I would argue that they not only have something very similar in common, but in fact, this is the most important thing they have in common if you want to be good at studying, if you want to be good at remembering the things that you learn and applying it successfully in real life. Indeed, there was a 
big study that was done that looked at a bunch of different possible study methods. And I would say with a little bit of um, glossing just to lump some ideas together, this was listed as the number one studying method by that study. Now I have a little citations here. Any of the parents or teachers want to look at what my work was that I'm basing this on. So what is it? What is the thing that they have in common? Well, once again, I'm going to kind of drag your interest out a little bit further and give you a little uh, test to see if you can figure it out. So I want you to imagine you're in a situation where you've been given a text. Let's say it's about a 10 page document and it's about something that you might study in school. So you've all gotten these little printouts in school before where they give you, you know, some story of history or something else and you are required to answer questions about it later. Now imagine you have only a certain amount of time to study it and you're trying to get the best possible score. So that's your goal is that you wanna get the best possible score with the same amount of time. Now imagine there's four different methods you could choose. The first is to just read through the text once. So just be very careful and just read through once and then try to do the test. The second would be to just read it through multiple times. So read the text once and then read it again and then read it again until you run out of time or you feel like you've got it. Third method, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but this is a common kind of a popular tool in the sort of um, studying kind of hacks community is what's called a concept map. So this idea, I'm not gonna go into it too much, but the basic idea is that you put the sort of central idea in the center and you draw little arrows to the sort of sub ideas. And the idea is that you're trying to take the text, which was written as a bunch of series of sentences and turning it into some kind of map to visually display how all the ideas relate. And finally, there is free recall. So free recall means that you read through the text once. So in this case, it's like the single review. It's like number one. But after that, instead of continuing to read it like you would do in number two or making a concept map the way you would do in number three, you close the book and you try as much as possible to remember everything that you can that was in the text. Now, here's what's important. Why it's called free recall is that it's not a test. Um, there's no questions. You're just trying to remember everything that you can. Indeed, you actually don't even get feedback about what you got right or wrong. You just keep the book closed and you just try to remember everything that you can without opening it. So which of these four methods would you think would work best? So think about this and I want you to just don't, don't say it out loud, but just think of an answer in your head right now. One, two, three, or four. Which one would you pick if you wanted to do the best on the following test? So before I go into how the students actually performed, I want to talk about an interesting experiment that followed this exact thing. So this was done by Karpicki and I believe Janelle Blunt in 2011 out of the University of Purdue. And they didn't just test the students. Importantly, they divided the students into four groups based on the four different studying methods. But before they tested them, they asked them how well they think they would do. So they asked each of the groups, how well do you think you'll perform on the test? And what we get is something that looks like this. Now, I, I hope everyone here is familiar with a bar graph, but basically what it means is that the taller the bar is, the better they thought they would do on the test. So the people who did the repeated review, the yellow one that we, we kind of covered before, reading it over and over again, they thought that they would do the best. They were like, oh, I know this. I've read this document like six times. I know what's on the test. In contrast, those who did free recall thought they would do the worst. They shut the book and they tried to answer the questions and they were like, oh my God, I don't know any of the answers. I don't know any of them. Now, the people who did single review and concept map were somewhere in between in terms of how confident they were on the test. Now, how do you think they actually did? Well, it looked like this. So in this case, the people who did free recall, meaning that they only read the text once, they never looked at it again, they shut the book, and they tried to practice remembering what was in the text, remembered far, far more, even though they thought they would do the worst. So it worked the best, even though the students thought they would do the worst. So what the heck is going on here? This is something very confusing. And I think this is honestly very important because if we are fundamentally deceived, 
about what actually makes a difference when we're learning things. We can waste a lot of time doing the repeated review like the students do it would and not doing free recall and thinking that we know the material but actually performing poorly on tests and in real life. So I want to try to explain this this way. What is happening, and this is sort of one popular explanation, I believe it's uh, owed to the psychologist uh, R.A. Bjork, if anyone wants to uh, follow up on this. And the idea here is that when we have facts or information that we want to learn, and this doesn't just have to be trivia, it doesn't have to just be questions and answers, it could be, you know, how do you do long division, or it could be how do you, um, you know, understand what happened in the Peloponnesian War, or, or whatever matters to you in what you're trying to learn. It doesn't just have to be facts. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to get it into our brain. We're trying to store it somewhere. And what we would like to ask ourselves is how well will I remember this? Will I remember the information later? But unfortunately, it turns out our brains don't actually have the ability to answer this question. We don't have the ability to look at a fact and know, oh, I will remember this a year later. Now we, we can guess, but we can't know. And so what we often do, and this is the theory of Ari Bjork, is that we substitute this question that we actually don't have the ability to answer with one that we can answer. And this is, instead of, will I remember this, we want to substitute it for, how familiar is this? So how easy does this feel to me to read and understand this fact. Because we all know that the things that feel easy and familiar to us, we're more likely to remember in the future than things that feel really strange or complicated or things that we don't understand. And so this is normally a pretty good rule of thumb. If you just follow this rule of thumb and just said to yourself, okay, I'm going to just try to remember things as they, you know, as they come up and the things that feel more familiar to me are probably gonna be the things that I remember. But where this is a problem is when we're looking at the study before, because it tricks you. Because as you read something once and twice and three times, it becomes more and more familiar to you. This is un unequivocal. If you read something three or four times, you feel like you almost are predicting what the next sentence is going to be. And that gives you a very strong signal that this is very familiar. However, it turns out that this is not the best way to remember that information. In contrast, when we are making our memories, what matters is not simply having the information in our mind. Importantly, we also need a map to get there. It's not enough to just have knowledge in your head. You need to be able to retrieve the knowledge when you are asked questions or when you're thinking about the topic. And this ability to retrieve the knowledge is as important, if not more, than merely knowing it somewhere. And this is what's so important. So when we're doing free recall, in contrast, what is happening is that we start out trying to remember something, some question leading to an answer. We're trying to remember it. It's very difficult. But over time, if we keep practicing it, the link between the question or the topic or the prompt and the answer, the correct answer, becomes a little stronger and a little stronger until it is very direct and very strong. And this means that when we are given the question, we can very easily, like a map, drive from where the question is to the answer is. And this is what is so important. So I want to expand this and add a couple little uh, wrinkles to this if you're following me so far. And one of these is again by the psychologist R.A. Bjork, this is desirable difficulties. And the basic idea here is that the harder the test questions are, and this is by, by what I mean test, I mean when you're doing practice for yourself, when you are trying to practice this in your study and you have that hour to study the text, the harder it is, the harder the questions are, the harder it is for you to remember, the more you end up learning. So how would this look? Well, one way you could imagine testing yourself is with recognition only. So this is like a multiple choice test where you have the question and you have different answers and all you have to do is pick which one is the right answer. This is an easier test than having just the question and not having an answer. So you have to create the answer rather than picking it out of a list. And this is even easier than doing free recall where you don't even have a question. You're just asked to remember everything you can from the text and you don't have, um, you don't even have questions after it. And what was found in studies is that when you test people using free recall, they will remember things better than when they have prompts and they will remember things better with prompts than when they do multiple choice tests. However, and this is a very important caveat, 
is that it works as long as you successfully remember it. So there's a trade-off. If you make the test way too hard and you don't remember anything, then you're not practicing it very well. But if you make the test too easy in contrast, you are so also are not going to be able to learn as much as you could. So the key when you are teaching something or studying something is to try to select questions that are at that threshold of they're as difficult as they can be while still being able to give you the right answer. And so if I were to try to work on studying the text, I would start with free recall. I would start with trying to remember everything I can unprompted. Then I would try to see if there's any questions that are there that I can answer. So I might, you know, if there were some questions in the text, if there were some questions after, I would try to ask myself questions. And if I still couldn't answer those, then maybe I would want to do multiple choice or do some kind of uh, recognition test. However, I think this is the important thing, is that this idea that we want to avoid things that are difficult when we're studying, we want things to be easy for us, actually drives in the opposite direction of what causes us to learn best. And so this is a sort of unfortunate truth, perhaps, of learning and studying that the things that are more mentally effortful result in more results. But this is also a very powerful lesson that you can apply to whatever you want to learn. Why? Because most people will avoid doing hard things. Most people will not understand this relationship. And so they will do whatever is easiest for them. And that might mean that they spend hours and hours and hours doing the repeated review, looking over their notes over and over and over again. And you will spend a fraction of the time doing free recall and you will end up performing better on the test. And this will help you immensely if you are trying to learn something in college where there's a lot of competition or high school where you're trying to get the best score and you want to get the best possible score with the least investment of time so that you can you know, do well in your studies in the future. So let's talk about another little wrinkle here. So this is another study by Karpicki from 2009. And what happened was similar to the study before, except in the study before where we had the four different methods, students were just told which method to use. So they didn't have a choice. They weren't told, okay, you know, do whatever you want to do to study and then we'll see which one works best. Rather, they were said, okay, you're going to read this once, you're going to read this multiple times, you're going to do a concept map, you're going to do free recall. So in this experiment, they did it in a more naturalistic way, the way that you would actually approach it if you were a student, which is that you are given a choice. And so what they had is they had students choose how they wanted to study. And they found that a lot of students didn't feel ready for doing the kind of free recall, practice testing, they wanted to do repeat review because they didn't feel ready yet. So those students chose repeat review when they were given a choice. However, tricky experimenters that they are, they uh, tricked them and they made it so it was impossible for them to choose. So they took the same students who didn't feel ready and some of them, they didn't allow them to choose repeat review. They forced them to do free recall instead. So in this case, this is a more naturalistic setting because the student is choosing him or herself to do a certain studying tactic and the experimenter is saying, no, 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 you have to do free recall. I know you don't feel ready, but you have to do free recall. Well, what do you think happened? Well, it turns out that those who were forced to do free recall perform better on the test than those who did repeat review. So what this shows, this study, and I hope is clear, is that it's not simply that we automatically know the right way to study and we're you know, just always picking what's best for us because we know the right way to learn things. Rather, we very often opt for something that is easier because we don't feel ready, even though it is less effective. So this is the big idea to remember things well. And this is important for any subject you will ever learn in the future, anything you're gonna do on your job, anything that you are going to do in life. To remember things well, you need to practice remembering, not just looking at things. So let's go back to those first stories that I talked about in the beginning and see if they maybe make a bit more sense. So in the situation with my friend with the passport, what he did differently is that he never looked at his passport. He just tried to recall it from memory. Now, it probably was the case that in the beginning, he gets a new passport. Maybe he got it wrong a few times. So he, he writes it down and then he, he checks his passport and finds out, oh, I got it wrong and I have to change it. Whereas for me, being cautious and not wanting to make any mistakes and, and just wanting to be extra careful, I always would start by opening my passport and just copying it over from one to the other. So in this case, I practiced the repeated review strategy of opening my passport and looking at it again and again and again. And my friend practiced the free recall strategy and that was why he memorized his passport number and not me. 
What about the situation where you're trying to remember the person's name? Well, in this case, it's not an issue of recall, but it reflects the idea that we were talking about before that we substitute familiarity for the ability to remember something. And what is more familiar than someone's name? If someone says their name is John, that's a name you've heard before. That is something you've heard probably many, many, many times before. So what your brain says to yourself when you hear the name John is, oh yeah, that's a name, I know that name. But unfortunately, the fact that you know the name does not help you very much when you have to remember which name you know before was the name of the person. And so the reason that we often forget names right after they're said is because we are not adequately paying attention to them and we are thinking that we will remember them because they are so familiar. And what about the studying situation? Well, I hope it's clear by now. Very often, students use strategies that are like repeated review. Now, maybe they do something a little bit more sophisticated. Maybe they recopy their notes. Maybe they draw little circles around it in concept maps. Maybe they try to underline things and, and rewrite stuff. But fundamentally, if the book is open and you're looking at it while you're studying, you're not doing retrieval practice. You are doing something like repeated review. And so if we go back to the original study, I don't know, I don't know how many slides I'm back with that, so I, I won't skim back. But if you remember the bar graph we had, the people who did the concept map, which is the theory that most students thought would perform the best, actually perform worse than free recall. And this is because the important thing for remembering stuff is once again, to remember things well, you need to practice remembering, not just looking at things. So how can you actually apply this? Well, I'm gonna go through five methods. You don't have to remember all the methods, but I think they're just good for examples to think through it. So one method would be to use flashcards. Flashcards are a very effective learning strategy because they force you to do recall. You put the question on one side, you put the answer on the other, and when the kind of thing you're learning works really well in a question and answer format, so you're trying to remember trivia, you're trying to remember dates, you're trying to remember definitions, this works really well. If you put it on one side, you are forced to try to remember it before you look at the answer. On the other hand, if you put question and answer on the same page, you can just look at the answer when you say it, and it is not nearly as effective. And I hope by now you understand why it's important that the flashcard has two sides. Method two, do homework. I know I'm not gonna be making a lot of fans when I say do homework, but I will say, to be honest, a lot of people, and this not includes only students, a lot of adults think the main way that you learn something is by sitting in a lecture like this one and listening to someone giving you information. Whereas, often, how you learn the material is by actually working with it, actually doing problems, actually practicing recall. And so, the way to think about homework, the way to think about any practice you do after is that it is not there to just check whether you learned it while sitting in the class. It is very often the way that you learn it. Method three, free recall, which we've talked about before. The reason I like free recall is because you don't need anything to do free recall. You could do free recall with this lecture right now. Once this conversation is done, you could try to write down on a piece of paper, what did that guy talk about who had the you know poorly drawn drawings on the slideshow? What did he talk about over half an hour? How much can I remember? And I think you would be surprised, because I've done this exercise before, about how little you can remember, that there's a lot of things that you forget. And so there's a discomfort in doing free recall, in not being clear what you just read or what you just watched. But this is also why it works, because of those desirable difficulties. Because it is hard to remember is the very reason why you will remember things better when you practice this. Method number four is to explain it to someone else. So you read it, you get an understanding, and then you try to teach it to someone else. And the reason that this works really well, especially is if you don't have your notes open, you're not reading your notes to the other person, you have it closed and you have to create something, is that you are practicing retrieval. So you're not only practicing retrieval, but you're also trying to organize what you've learned. So if you were learning something that is a bit difficult to understand, maybe a bit confusing, then this is the method to use. So if you're learning how to do trigonometry and you don't remember what the cosine rule is or the sine rule is, then this would be the method to use. Try to teach the sine rule to someone else and you will remember remember it much, much better with much less time. Method five is practice tests. So <laughs> practice tests are similar to the free recall, except you are actually given questions. And the more similar the questions you're given on the practice test are to the actual test, the better your score will be. Now, I know that not all of your classes are going to have practice tests. 
However, many of the most important tests you will ever do in your life do have practice tests. If you want to become a lawyer and you are going to study for the LSAT, guess what? There are lots of practice tests. If you are trying to pass a big final exam in a class in, let's say, calculus in university, there are going to be practice tests out there. And so the more that there is a similarity between the questions that you practice on and the questions you actually do, the more effective your results will be. Now, there's some interesting research on this showing that if you have to choose between a test that's harder or more similar, uh, it is the case that sometimes if you do a test that's somewhat harder, you will get better studying. So the examples that I saw in uh, research were the final test was a multiple choice, but they had students practice something like free recall instead. And those who did free recall performed a little better than those who just did multiple choice practice tests because multiple choice doesn't involve as much retrieval as doing free recall. But that being said, if you ever have access to practice tests, this is your number one resource if you want to do uh, well on the exam for the amount of studying time you have. Now, I've rambled on for a long time here, and I hope that you will remember something. But the best way is to test it, right? And so what did you learn today? And you don't have to speak up right now, but try to think in your head, what were some of the concepts that we covered in the class right now? So which of the four studying methods that, were, that I talked about in the beginning of the lecture worked best? Do you remember? Free recall. There we go. What are desirable difficulties? What does that mean? A little harder. Don't worry, Choosing don't a difficulty? Answer. You want to be challenged? Right. And what if you don't feel ready yet? What should you do? Free recall. Very good. So I'm going to exit out of this. That is my presentation. I hope you found it a little useful. I can say without a doubt that no one ever taught me this when I was in school. And I think it is true for most students. So if you take it to heart and you practice it, you can really go a lot further with your limited amount of time to do well on tests and studying and what have you. Mm, super, super valuable information, even for adults. It's not taught to adults either. Yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you how many, a good example of this um, is I remember, and now this is, we're not talking about studying anymore, but it's the same principle. I, uh, I remember helping, um, this was actually my wife, she had to do a, a big presentation uh, for an accounting class that she was doing. She's getting her accounting designation. She had to give a big presentation and she had written out her presentation on cue cards. She doesn't give a lot of speeches and uh, she was reading them over and over and over again. And I was saying, no, 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 that's not how you memorize a speech. You have to put the cards down and try to deliver it and then only look at it when you don't remember stuff. And she was like, no, 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 but I don't know it yet. Sound familiar? And then um, I, I kind of pushed her. I said, okay, just try doing it. And it was really hard. <laughs> and she's like, oh, I don't remember anything, even though I've been looking at these cards over and over and over again. And so the way to memorize the speech, of course, is to write your notes, surely write it out, but don't look at it when you're trying to do it. And only look at it when you can't remember something, when you've been, you know, pausing for, you know, 30 seconds. And then you're like, what was that point? And then I bring it up. Another related example is I gave a speech, and this was a, a big presentation I had to give. I was on a stage with you know, lots of people, so I was rehearsing quite a bit using this method rehearsing at home, and I was uh, treating my wife as a guinea pig. She had to as my victim while listening to me give this speech over and over again, and she made the claim to me kind of half-jokingly. She's like, oh, I've heard you give this speech so much. I can give your speech. And I said to you, really, you can give my speech? Uh, because I, I have to really like, work at remembering everything that's in my speech. And I've given it a bunch of times. And so I was like, okay, why don't you try to give my speech? And then she tries to give my speech. And again, it was very difficult. She had heard it like six or seven times. So you'd think that she'd remember everything that's in it, but it's actually quite difficult. And so this illusion that we have, that the things that are familiar to us are the things that we will remember when we are asked them on tests, when we have to use them in real life. Uh, is a pervasive one and it's one that afflicts not only students but adults and people trying to do well when they need to remember things. My understanding is that there's questions now, I, otherwise I'm just sitting here. Mm -hmm. If anyone wants to ask me any questions or, or they'd like to me to discuss something else. 
anyone have any questions? <laughs> it's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know how it is. It, it's Friday, yeah, but it's yeah, also yeah. pouring rain outside. Oh, that's too bad. It's beautiful weather here, so <laughs> I might go sit on the balcony after. You're lucky. <laughs> Um, I think this is really cool. Um, I think, um, I don't know, do you guys, um, have you guys started writing speeches yet in school? Well, sort of, sort of. Like, if you, if you mean, like, a project that we have to, like, write down what we're going to say and all, yes. If you don't mean that, then no. All right, because this, this could be totally valuable. Um, these are totally valuable methods when, when presenting a speech or having to remember what you're going to be hearing with your class. And uh, so this is, this is really cool, I think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Well, I hope it's useful. I know that um, certainly the person who's advising to do more homework and do harder studying is not always the, the biggest fan. But I think that especially as you get into situations and it may, may be soon for you, it may not be for a while, but you get into situations where you are struggling on a class and you, you are working really hard and you really are putting in a lot of effort, but you don't seem to be getting the grades you want, you don't seem to be getting the results you want on the tests. Um, I've talked to many students who feel this way, that they feel like what they're doing right now is kind of hopeless. They've been just spending hours and hours and hours every day studying, but they're not doing this. They're doing repeated review. And because they're doing repeated review, when they get to the test, they don't do well. And, and then, they're, then they're disappointed with themselves. And so I think this is something to keep in mind. For some of you, I think especially at the age you're at right now, often I remember when I was that age, the homework is assigned. You don't have a lot of like choice over how you study things. People just tell you to do this homework. And you know that's good. The homework will help you practice the material and then you have a test on it. But as you get into high school and as you get in university, um, it's a lot more okay, here's the information. Now they just expect you to know how to learn it. And often we're never taught how to learn it. And so we use these ineffective strategies. Right. Any questions, comments? <laughs> no, but. Thank you. Yeah, excellent presentation. This actually I'm glad everyone understood. I was a little nervous doing this because I've only done presentations normally for, for older people. And I was like, is it bad that I'm putting citations on this little doodle here? Yeah, <laughs> like, no, it's an so I'm glad, I'm glad everyone understood. And, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people that do these, these, um, these mini lessons, they've never had to break down these ideas for kids. So hopefully you learned something as well doing this. <laughs> it was something yes. new for you. Um, Thank you so much. This was super cool. Yeah. And um, we record these videos and- um, I want to more about what you said about, you don't have to do it today, mm -hmm. but I want you to start thinking well. of how to- really And we upload them. And uh, this is, I think, totally one of those videos that is going to be reviewed, if not, you know, soon in the future, because these are things that are going to be really valuable to these kids uh, as they get older and as they continue their learning. and. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, I thank you so much for having me. It was, it was great awesome. to talk about these things. And, you know, you were saying about um, kind of breaking it down for kids, but I feel like uh, kids are pretty smart. They're yeah. smarter than we give them credit a lot of times. And a lot of times people think when they're talking to adults that they don't need to simplify and then they don't realize how much goes over the head. And I've thank had conversations you. with adults where I've made that, that mistake where I've I've talked about, well, it's this versus this. And then I'm talking about it for five minutes. And I'm like, you understand the difference between this and this. And, and they're like, mm, not really. <laughs> and they were just too afraid to stop me. And I'm like, oh, because none of what I made said then just made sense for the last right. 10 minutes I've been talking. <laughs> so it's been good to, good to talk about it. Um, if anyone has any other questions about the, the topic of learning and studying and how to do it better, then I'm more than willing to field questions. Otherwise, uh, I'll leave it to you to decide what you want to do. Yeah. Um, and okay, do you know? Go do ahead, you know ahead. why, um, rep like looking at it repeatedly, um, doesn't help? Right. So the idea here, and I kind of showed it with, I had that little guy holding the, the map sort of, is that one of the real difficulties we have in remembering is not having it in your head, but being able to go from a question or some sort of prompt to the answer. And that's, that is what's difficult, making that path. And when you just look at the answer, 
kind of what you're doing is that you're learning to remember it with the the prompt being the thing itself so uh, that's not, not always terrible things to know if you want to remember whether you've seen someone's face before you look at their face and just have i seen this face before and that can be quite helpful. Um, however, if your goal was I have to draw their face, <laughs> then that's a very different goal because you don't, you haven't maybe thought about, okay, how do I go from a blank piece of paper to this person's face? And similarly, when you're answering a question, if someone says to you, um, you know, uh, what would be an example of something? <laughs> I'm trying to think of, an, of a fact right now, but um, you know, let's say hydrogen is the lightest element or something like this. Um, if someone were to ask you, what is the lightest element, then you have to have a path from that question all the way to hydrogen. Whereas if you just read in the book, hydrogen is the lightest element, then when you see that sentence, hydrogen is the lightest element, then it says, oh, I've seen this before. You're doing kind of a very short, short trip. You're just starting at the information and saying, yeah, I've seen it before. I have it in my head. Whereas most tests that we do in real life, you're starting from somewhere other than the answer and you have to get to the answer. And that's why retrieval is so important is because we need to build that pathway in our minds from the thing that is the question or the prompt to the answer. And uh, that's often very difficult. Um, it's often the case that something could be in your mind in some way that you would recognize it, but you wouldn't be able to retrieve it. Do you have any thoughts on the correlation between learning and drawing at the same time, like doodling while you learn? Uh, well, I like doodling. I think I think there's some people who are naturally, um, they like drawing and they like to represent things visually. I know other people that it becomes kind of like frustration for them because they don't like their drawings. So I wouldn't say that you have to draw uh, to learn things well. I know certainly know people that don't and they learn things well. However, I think one of the things that drawing can do is that uh, anytime you have to convert what you're learning into something else forces you to kind of make some room in the territory. So I'll give an example. Uh, one of the advices that I have for people if they're taking notes is don't write down exactly what the person said, put it in your own words. And the reason for this is that when you have to put in your own words, you have to think about what did the words mean? <laughs> Whereas when you just write down the words, you only have to write down what the words sounded like. And the, the reason that this is important, and there's a, a really, a really excellent cognitive psychologist by the name of Daniel Willingham, and he has a phrase that I think is very good. And he says that memory is the residue of thought. And so the idea here is that what you're thinking about is what you end up remembering. And what I mean by that, and that's quite specific, is that if you're just thinking about what the words are, but you're not thinking about what they mean, you tend to remember not what they mean. It's, it's, it's hard to remember it that way. And because we tend to remember what things mean a lot better than we remember like the literal words of, of what someone said, then if you're only thinking about the words, it's harder to remember it in the long term. So if you have to paraphrase it, if you have to turn it into your own words, then it's a little easier. And so if you're drawing a picture, if the person wasn't drawing a picture, then that's another way of turning it into something that you've made and you've thought about. And so I think that can be valuable. I think at the same time, there's probably classes where you're barely struggling to keep up. And in that case, you know, if you're not drawing pictures, don't beat yourself up. But if you're a little bored <laughs> in the class and you can draw pictures of the thing they're talking about, then that would probably be helpful. I think the opposite is when you draw like doodles that are, you know, just little like concentric circles or, or little mazes or something on your page that have nothing to do with the lecture. In that case, you're probably not doing yourself favors just because the thing you're thinking about is these little doodles you're doing and that has nothing to do with what you're trying to learn. Thank you. All right. Last chance for any other questions or comments. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a treat. Uh, have a great long weekend. Oh, thank and, uh, you. Yeah. Can everyone say thank you? Thank Take you. care. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>